Radio Kim Inspirasi Infora Islami. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good afternoon to the dear listeners of Ikim FM. Welcome to another episode of Global Muslim Matters, your portal to the world of Muslim affairs across the globe. This show is a collaboration program between Ikim with International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies, IAIS Malaysia. And listeners, for today's episode of Global Muslim Matters, we have Mr. Wana Imwan Mansur, research fellow at IAIS Malaysia in the studio. Assalamualaikum Mr. Wanaim. Uh, Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It is such a pleasure to have you in the studio and dear listeners for today Mr. Wanaim is actually going to talk about uh, his previous episode where it is going to be a continuation uh, from the previous episode where Mr. Wanaim Mamasur uh, talked about unraveling alliances, the Gaza crisis and Israel's eroding global support. And Mr. Wanaim, in previous episode, we look at how history and politics have influenced the alliance between Israel and its international allies, especially the U.S. You have also talked about the recent problems and tensions that have come up in the relationship. So I would like to ask, um, in the past few Few weeks. How has the international opinion on Israel changed, especially after the ceasefire on November 24th? All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my uh, uh, happiness uh, to be here with uh, Aikim again and yes. uh, with you again, uh, Miss mm-hmm. Patricia, yes. uh, to talk on a very important uh, subject. Mm. Uh, to date, we have reached almost exactly two months since the last 7th of to- October attack by Hamas, mm. which was uh, unprecedented and which have baffled even the uh, famous intelligence uh, Mossad. And uh, the humanitarian uh, crisis and the, uh, uh, the catastrophe that been happening to the Palestinians has dominated the headlines for almost two months and it has become so severe that it runs the risk of desensitizing uh, many of us. Mm -hmm. So at first the casualties, the loss of life is uh, 1,000 and then it increased uh, to 5,000, 10,000 and now 20,000 casualties, uh, precious lives has been lost. So sometimes uh, this uh, high amount of numbers can desensitize uh, some of us and I hope that our ongoing discussion uh, mm-hmm. in IKIM as well as uh, the Global Muslim Affairs uh, discussion can help us avoid this uh, uh, desensitizing effect. Mm-hmm. So back to the question. I think that's a very uh, important question. Uh, but before that, I think I have to talk about a little bit uh, about how Israel relies a lot on public perception Mm -hmm. and the support of the global community. So then uh, we can understand more why the change in uh, international opinion on Israel has a a very devastating effect to the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, So first of all, uh, Israel relies a lot on foreign aid. That's uh, well known, but not just uh, in terms of uh, economy but also military Mm -hmm. and also uh, moral support. For instance, uh, Israel's closest ally, the the US, have uh, uh, sent $124 billion since World War II. Mm -hmm. And Israel has been one of the most uh, uh, received foreign aid from the US, if not the most, uh, country. And uh, in average, on average, uh, the U.S. sent about uh, 3.8 billion per 3.8 year billion. in terms of military assistance mm-hmm. uh, to the Israel, especially mm-hmm. under the new 10-year plan mm-hmm. that began in uh, 2016. But uh, recently, the House of Representatives in the U.S. has uh, passed uh, 14.4 billion uh, foreign aid to Israel but uh, it is still uh, in the process of being approved. Mm -hmm. It has uh, to go to other processes like the Senate and Mm -hmm. finally the presidential approval. So it cannot just like posture just like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
That's why. But uh, interestingly, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff also happening in the US, but maybe we'll talk about it later. Mm. But what I can say at the moment is now that uh, the US itself uh, is currently uh, being divided. Mm -hmm. uh, and the House of Representatives uh, vote to approve the uh, $14 billion foreign aid is uh, actually very divided. Mm -hmm. The Republican uh, is the one who proposed the foreign aid and mm -hmm. the one supporting it and the democrats uh, it seems in this case is uh, uh, opposing to it yeah opposite to it and they vote along party lines mm -hmm. so that's uh, quite uh, an interesting development mm -hmm. because before this uh, foreign aid to israel is a bipartisan effort so they usually agree together despite across uh, party lines mm -hmm. and also uh, in terms of uh, Uh, society also, uh, Israel relies a lot on on international support. For instance, uh, Germany and the European Union, because they need uh, the help and the cooperation of these countries to resettle Jewish uh, migrants coming from Europe. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of technology, research and development and developing their education. So they rely a lot. On these European countries, mm -hmm. and in terms of economy, uh, the uh, Israel because uh, it is a small country, it relies a lot uh, on uh, uh, economic activities with other countries. And interestingly, the BDS movement, the boycott, divest, and sanction movement, yes. has uh, affected uh, Israel massively. Mm -hmm. it, it is said that. Uh, Israel is losing 1.4 billion per year due to BDS mm -hmm. and even 46 drop in foreign direct investments mm -hmm. uh, to Israel. So I think that is why Israel wants to pursue uh, the Abraham Accords with uh, its neighboring Arab countries and maybe uh, other key Arab countries because Israel depends a lot on the global community's perception and support. So uh, in general, I think uh, Israel is currently experiencing immense pressure and that's why uh, Israel finally agreed for a ceasefire mm -hmm. uh, for two weeks. Although, unfortunately, Israel has recently resumed its indiscriminate bombing attacks mm -hmm. uh, towards civilians. And uh, we know that the United States uh, has been Israel's main supporter in the international arena, providing diplomatic, uh, military and also economic assistance. However, some critics say that the U.S. support isn't without conditions and that it comes with certain expectations and uh, demands. Mm -hmm. So at the grassroots level, uh, the way American support Israel has shown some divisions and differences. We touched a bit before uh, in the previous episode about the evangelical Christians and their narrative. But uh, now some other Christian scholars and groups are using the Bible to question that support. So what are key developments regarding this? And are there any other groups within American society which are having second thoughts about Israel? Yes, uh, correct. Uh, you have mentioned the uh... Uh, the evangelist Christian support towards Israel mm -hmm. and how it, it has been a very detrimental uh, effect towards the Palestinians and how actually uh, one of the primary support coming from the US comes from the evangelist Christians. Evangelist Christian. They have been supporting Israel since uh, in, uh, inception in 1948 mm -hmm. and until now it has been a very strong, uh, it has a very strong lobby mm -hmm. towards uh, pro-Israeli Uh, policies. Uh, however, <coughs> as I said before, there has been a very interesting development in the US itself. Uh, foreign policy towards Israel has now uh, been more divided than ever. Mm -hmm. Just now I mentioned about how the US is currently passing a bill to send uh, 14 billion dollars to the to Israel mm -hmm. and Voting somehow has been across party lines. Uh, before this, is a bipartisan uh, uh, vote. Now it has been partisan. So Democrats are voting uh, across their party lines, and Demo and Republicans are putting uh, the voting across their parties. 
So I think one of the main reason for this is uh, the development of young generation. Mm-hmm. So the coming up of younger generation in US society. Uh, one of the polls, uh, the Gallup polls, uh, in a survey, they they have revealed that 26% uh, of Americans do sympathize with Palestinians. Mm-hmm. And this is, although it's very small amount, 26%, 26%. but it is a uh, 20-year high, actually. Then previous year. Uh, compared to 20 years 20 back. 20 years ago. So okay. it's a, actually a, a good trend for mm-hmm. the Palestinians. And also, in a survey by Pew Research, uh, it shows that U.S. adults under 30 uh, years old view the Palestinian people at least uh, more warmly than the Israeli people at 61% compared to uh, Israeli people only 56%. Mm-hmm. And and rate the Palestinian government as favorably. I mean, the young uh, people in uh, the US view Palestinian government more favorably at mm-hmm. 35% compared to the Israeli government at 34%. Mm-hmm. So we can see a clear trend here that the younger population supports... Uh, have more support to the Palestinians. Mm-hmm. And I've met uh, several uh, experts as well, coming from the US and the UK uh, in a recent conference, and they say, yes, the younger generations, especially those who are tech-savvy, uh, they have uh, social media mm-hmm. and uh, TikTok yes. and so forth, they have a more favorable view because mm-hmm. maybe they have a lot more information directly coming from the ground compared to... A lot more to, exposure. A lot more exposure, yeah, yes. correct? Compared to the one coming from uh, traditional mm-hmm. news outlets uh, that has been maybe censored uh, more than before. So, um, this uh, trend among the young has a lot of, uh, a lot of impact mm-hmm. and it goes across uh, dimensions and across layers. We mentioned the, the evangelist Christians uh, this trend also affects evangelist Christians as well, because uh, the 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 leadership of the evangelist Christians who have this uh, conservative approach towards Israel mm-hmm. is slowly, slowingly aging mm-hmm. and being replaced with with younger voices. I see. Uh, and these younger voices, they have a more uh, progressive outlook. Mm-hmm. They have more diverse outlook mm-hmm. towards what's uh, going in the. Uh, Gaza conflict, mm-hmm. and uh, and they are more open to new interpretations. So for a long time, Christian evangelists, uh, Zionists, uh, supported Israel based on the Old Testament's uh, description of Israel as uh, God's chosen people and land. Mm-hmm. They believed that Israel had a divine right to exist and expand, and that supporting Israel would hasten the second coming of Christ. So they believed that supporting Israel directly uh, related with the second coming of uh, Jesus in uh, in Islam we call uh, Isa alayhi salam. Mm-hmm. But however, uh, new arguments by New Testament theologians and scholars uh, have recently gained more public attention. As I mentioned before in the previous episode, they claim that the support for Israel should not be unconditional but contingent on Israel's adherence to God's covenant and the Talmudic laws. Uh, and this include uh, being godly, not stealing, uh, no murder, and so on. Mm-hmm. So, for example, they, uh, this, yeah, younger voices in the evangelist Christians, they criticize Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories, its violation of uh, human rights, and its disregard for international law mm-hmm. as uh, contrary to God's will. And they also point out that Jesus taught love and compassion for all people regardless mm-hmm. of their ethnicity or religion. And this includes the Palestinians also. And uh, the rise of new narratives uh, among Christian scholars uh, has, very, has been very important in this regard. They argue that God's promises to Israel in the Old Testament have been fulfilled in Christ and extended to the church. Mm-hmm. which is the new Israel. So according to this uh, uh, new narrative by Christian scholars, also known as uh, covenantal theology uh, related to covenants, mm-hmm. they say that uh, 
the covenant related tied to the physical aspect of the world uh, for example with the temple in Israel mm-hmm. is now fulfilled with the coming of Jesus mm-hmm. so Jesus has now uh, become the temple so it's become internationalized so, so it's the, not the uh, yes. physical coming of the Jesus itself it's just that uh, it is being alive sorry it is being portrayed in the yes. temple mm-hmm. exactly so exactly uh, so the physical aspect is no longer important just mm-hmm. like you mentioned it has been international at least from this uh, christian perspective mm-hmm. and this is uh, these opinions are based uh, deeply rooted in christian scripture mm-hmm. as well and some of the scholars if i can name them that supported this uh, new covenantal theology is uh, gary m birch uh, stephen sizer i met him uh, last week mm-hmm. uh, he attended a, a conference on palestine mm-hmm. uh, at ais and also uh, Naim Atik. So these are some of the uh, uh, new scholars, Christian scholars that uh, argue against what evangelists has been uh, providing as their basis of support. Mm-hmm. And also because uh, the young generations have becoming more and more uh, prominent, uh, older generations of evangelist Christians are also aging and being replaced so mm-hmm. there is a a new potential change oh, in shift. how evangelist mm-hmm. uh is uh changing their position mm-hmm. on uh, on israel and palestine aside from evangelist christian i think uh, we'll we've spent a lot of time talking about evangelist christian mm-hmm. there are also a shift in the uh, conservatives among the u.s and it's also related with the uh, young uh, trend the young generational Uh, divide and it is uh, not just generational but also ideological mm-hmm. uh, the conservatives although they still support Israel and in, in general mm-hmm. but the new voices the younger voices especially the libertarian leaning conservatives have more sympathy uh, towards Palestine so libertarian is uh, people uh, 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 emphasizing liberty or freedom mm-hmm. so It's not actually about uh, the legitimacy of Israel. I mean, conservatives do still believe uh, the legitimacy of the country itself or maybe the regime itself. I've been saying country, but maybe here I think it's more suitable to say it's a regime because we, Malaysia do not uh, actually recognize, recognize the, yes. the state of Israel. Uh, but uh, they, they, the cons- these conservatives, they still uh, believe about They still support the legitimacy of Israel, but they are divided in terms of the responsibility, mm-hmm. in terms of the responsibility uh, of they themselves helping Israel, the, the responsibility of the Americans to help Israel. Maybe they believe Israel have a right to uh, to exist, but why should Americans support them, especially mm-hmm. uh, in the current state of the country, the economic country, the U.S. is currently having a steep Uh, deficit mm-hmm. so they they say that maybe we should help their people first should yes. help americans first mm-hmm. and also we can see uh, in social media even uh, conservative icons like uh, tucker carlson mm-hmm. and so andrew tate uh, a self-proclaimed uh, toxic masculinity icon he himself uh, has been throwing jabs to ben shapiro mm-hmm. saying that ben shapiro is a uh, uh, armchair warmonger And it's very interesting to see the dynamics changing in the conservative camp as well. Mm-hmm. So in general, I would say there is a clear changing uh, or shift uh, in demography in terms of U.S. support for Israel. And this is uh, largely in part due to the uh, growing of the younger generations. And in, even among the Jews, uh, the younger Jews, they... Uh, support uh, human rights mm-hmm. in Palestine, especially I mentioned before how the Jewish organization, organization Jewish Voice for Peace, is very instrumental in mm-hmm. uh, organizing demonstrations in uh, Capitol Hill and elsewhere in the U.S. And also, finally, if I may say this, aside from the increase of uh, youngsters mm-hmm. or younger generations, uh, I would say the increase of diversity in the U.S. also amplifies the voice of pro-Palestinians mm-hmm. or maybe pro-humanitarian voices 
that is uh, at loggerheads with what Israel is doing right now. Mm-hmm. So in a way, we can conclude that, uh, especially uh, in the younger generation, there has been a shift where more and more of these people, uh, they are becoming more supportive towards the Palestinians, especially if you look uh, on the social media, there are lots of people sharing videos about uh, what has been happening in the Gaza. It is very hard to deny what has been happening there. And uh, going beyond the United States, let's talk about the rise of the global south uh the global south especially china has been increasing its influence uh, its influence and pre- uh, pre- sorry presence uh, in the middle east they have become an alternative as they are offering help and partnership with the palestinians and other groups in the region um in your opinion what does china think about israel's aggression towards palestinians and what does china interest in that area yes Uh, I think that's a very interesting development in the ongoing crisis uh, between uh, uh, Palestinians and Israel. I think that is one of the unintended consequences of uh, the ongoing conflict. Israel might have the advantage uh, in terms of military might, mm-hmm. in terms of uh, funding, mm-hmm. And in terms of casualty numbers as well, mm-hmm. uh, they have a clear advantage. But uh, one of the unintended consequences of their heavy attacks, uh, heavy killing, murder of civilians is that uh, the US and the West is losing legitimacy in terms of uh, human rights and humanitarian uh, issues. Mm-hmm. And this creates a vacuum in which the global South is seen as being filling this gap uh, in terms of human rights and uh, humanitarian championship so so before that maybe i should uh, define what is the global south global south is the uh, is a group of uh, uh, latin america countries mm-hmm. and somehow china is also part of it mm-hmm. so it's, it is seen as a, a a cluster of a group of nations Uh, contrary to the uh, Western countries, and it's more uh, its nature is more developing, mm-hmm. and it is the future of the con- of the world because of the increasing economy mm-hmm. uh, of the global south, mm-hmm. and it has been said that it it will be one of the primary contender in terms of uh, superpowers. So. If there is a global south, of course, there are also there's also global um, north. North, yeah, yeah, yes. mm-hmm. Especially, yeah. So uh, the US and the Western countries are currently being set as the global north. Mm-hmm. So they are more uh, maybe they are more advanced in terms of technology. But global south is catching up uh, quickly, mm-hmm. especially uh, with China being one of the largest economy uh, in the world. And also a lot of other countries in Asia, for instance, uh, Indonesia, uh, Brazil. Brazil is uh, in other side of the continent. Mm-hmm. They are also a uh, fast-growing economy that will be uh, that will definitely uh, catch up to the uh, more uh, developed country. Mm-hmm. So, in terms of this crisis in Gaza, I think one of the unintended consequences of the humanitarian crisis in which uh, Israel has caused is the rise of the global south and especially China because uh, it has shown itself in UN especially as a balanced country mm-hmm. and a respectful country to both sides at the moment. It has close ties with uh, Palestinians, uh, Palestinians and as well as Israel. And I think so far the statements made by China has been very uh, neutral and maybe a little bit uh, pro uh, humanitarian or pro palestine mm-hmm. and in one of the exchanges i have with a palestinian scholar uh, he came to the conference uh, last week uh, at, a- at iais he said that the chinese have a good reputation among mm-hmm. gazans mm-hmm. and uh, so far at least uh, the trust is still there mm-hmm. and we know uh, how china is very uh, capable in terms of reconstructing or de- redevelopment. Uh, its construction is like one of the best in the world. Mm-hmm. So in terms of 
opportunity. China have a lot of opportunity to rebuild Gaza, redevelop Gaza. And this is actually one of the centerpiece of Chinese uh, foreign policy, mm-hmm. uh, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it is focusing more on development and reconstruction. So that is uh, actually China's expertise. And because they they have a very balanced reputation, I think they can exert more influence in mm-hmm. the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Although maybe as a caveat, I would say some of the obstacles uh, for China to become more influential in the Middle East is the U.S. because the U.S. still uh, one of the main uh, roadblocks for China to fully uh, involved, and because the U.S. is also Uh, still have a lot of historical and uh, cultural ties with Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is uh, hard to unravel. Mm-hmm. And also because maybe China at the moment lack uh, historical and cultural ties. At least uh, from the US, they have evangelicals, huh? Christians, so they have a close tie with uh, uh, Palestine and Israel. Mm-hmm. But the Chinese may be less so. And also because uh, maybe China is experiencing... Uh, criticism itself in terms of uh, other uh, other other foreign policies such as the Southeast China and there's also domestic issues involving Muslims themselves. Yes. So um, in a way, you do you believe that China has the potential to become the superpower in the region? Uh, definitely. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I'm also quoting other scholars saying the same uh, because they have the capability They have the reputation, mm-hmm. and also, I think China also wanted to expand their influence mm-hmm. uh, in in terms of the global scene. So they have these three motivations, mm-hmm. I would say, uh, to become more involved mm-hmm. in the crisis. And um, if you look at um, in the situation that that is happening uh, in Gaza, the uh, indiscriminate and inhuman bombing of civilians, the humanitarian crisis in general, uh, has exposed the growing divide within Israeli society. Different groups uh, in Israel have different feelings about the war and how the government is dealing with it, which is making the split between them even bigger. So in your view, what are the main reasons for the division and dissatisfaction? Yes, I, I know the topic for today is uh, uh, the eroding of global support for Israel. Mm-hmm. But uh, actually, I think it's also very important to uh, be aware that within Israel itself, the Israeli people are also losing faith in, in their government. It means that the government is losing support from its uh, citizens. Yes, mm-hmm. not just from the global community, but also from its domestic community. Mm-hmm. And this is uh, particularly true because of a lot of uh, impact uh, in terms of uh, primarily, I can say, uh, economy. According to a report by Reuters, Israel is expected to lose uh, 20 billion shekels mm-hmm. uh, uh, throughout the, the military campaign. And even in the first three weeks of the offensive, they have been losing about 100 Uh, billion shekels billion. so one shekel is like uh one ringgit 1.2 ringgit so it's about about the same with a uh, malaysian ringgit so 100 billion ringgit 100 billion in the first three weeks and mm-hmm. 200 billion uh, across the campaign and this is without the participation of uh, foreign uh, armies like uh, hasbullah mm-hmm. and maybe other militants so this is just that's a very optimistic uh, estimate of uh, how much Israel is losing. Mm-hmm. So this is a lot. And this is like uh, 10% of Israel's uh, domestic uh, gross uh, product. 10%. Yes. Mm. And this is uh, much, much more than what they are potentially receiving in terms of foreign aid uh, from the US, the $14 billion still yet to be passed, mm-hmm. and the $3.8 billion dollars, uh, annually from the US. So they are losing more than what they mm-hmm. generate. Mm-hmm. And uh, also there's a report, a survey also saying that only 27, uh, 27% of Israelis uh, support Netanyahu, uh, especially after the uh, 7th October attack. Mm-hmm. And even uh, more surprisingly, 80% Israelis 
believes that Netanyahu himself is uh, responsible for not managing uh, Israel's security, for allowing Hamas to enter their borders. And Netanyahu's party, the Likud, is also facing a decline in public support and loss of confidence from its allies and rivals. As, uh, as I mentioned before, the Prime Minister is widely blamed for the security and intelligence failures and how Netanyahu uh, manages this war. Many Israelis also accuse him of trying to evade responsibility <clears throat> and accountability for the crisis and in fact accuses him of uh, exploiting the war to delay his corruption trial and prolong his rule. Mm -hmm. And the primary rival for Netanyahu is uh, his ultra-orthodox parties Uh, although still uh, coalition partners uh, with Netanyahu, uh, the far-right Yamina, they are uh, increasingly distancing themselves from him and publicly expressing dissatisfaction with uh, his handling of the war. And some of them even consider uh, joining forces with opposition parties, uh, for example, led by uh, Yair Lapid and Benny Gantz to form a new government mm -hmm. itself. So, Actually, uh, in terms of uh, politics, Netanyahu is actually on a shaky ground. So we can say that his actions during the war is maybe uh, a symptom of uh, desperation or maybe just a last, last resort to cling towards power. Mm -hmm. And also the issues of hostages. I think it has been a very dividing issue, polarizing issue among Israelis about how <clears throat> Netanyahu has been heavily bombing mm -hmm. without, uh, without care of the hostages being mm -hmm. uh, over there as well. And this has been a source of uh, criticisms uh, towards Netanyahu among Israelis themselves. And um, as we are reaching the end uh, of this conversation, looking ahead to Gaza's future, what <clears throat> what obstacles and opportunities exist for achieving a lasting solution? The support of uh, international community for Israel has always been its uh, primary buttress or maybe uh, primary underpinning uh, support for Israel and Israel losing this global support is actually a very momentous shift mm -hmm. in terms of its uh, position and how they will react in the future and although currently the the global support is still uh, still there mm -hmm. the rising of the younger generations and also the rise of the global south is uh, quickly and swiftly changing these dynamics. And it seems that Israel might have to change its approach towards the Palestinians uh, sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. And considering the current circumstances, uh, the future of Gaza looks uh, positive, although the unfortunate loss of casualty The increasing global support for Gaza, I think, will be will determine how uh, the future path is going. And if I may end with the role of Malaysia, I think Malaysia has a lot of potential to become a good, uh, very uh, diplomatic uh, force yeah. in the region, especially uh, last uh, last two weeks, I think. Uh, the Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim's visit to Thailand. Mm. Uh, this is uh, the issue of Gaza has also been one of the focus. Uh, Prime Minister Srita Tavisin of Thailand uh, was reported to uh, to thank the Prime Minister for his uh, support in releasing the 20 hostages, Thai hostages in Gaza. And then this, I, I think this shows the Malaysia's diplomatic prowess mm. uh, in terms of uh, diplomacy. Malaysia has have had a good record in Southeast Asia. Uh, Malaysia has been playing a critical role in uh, also related to Thailand. The, the Patani uh, resistance has been a mediator. And I think because of Malaysia's 
historical ties and cultural ties with the Middle East because we are Muslim majority country, we can play a bigger role as a mediator uh, in the Middle East and maybe uh, expand Malaysia's influence in terms of the Malaysian diplomacy. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, another point I would like to stress is the the future of uh, younger generation. As uh, we mentioned, as we discussed before, the younger generation has been very important in shifting the perception on the, um, especially among Americans, not just evangelist Christians, but also among conservatives. So I think we should also appeal uh, to this younger generation and maybe uh, get them involved and maybe engage them and particularly in social media and engagement, I think these are uh, uh, the, some of the platforms that these uh, younger generations are very actively involved. Mm-hmm. And with that being said, I would like to thank Mr. Wanaim Wan Mansor, Research Fellow at IAIS Malaysia, for his insight on today's topic, Unraveling Alliances, the Gaza Crisis, and Israel's Eroding Global Support, Part 2. And we hope that today's interview will be beneficial and also inspiring to those who are listening to us either through radio or even through our social media. And again, Mr. Wanaim, thank you for being with us in the studio. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's uh, my pleasure as well, Miss Patricia. Yes. Thank you very much.